Welcome to the New Day Community Church Sermon Podcast. We hope you are encouraged by this message from the Nichols Road Campus. For more info, look us up at newdaycommunity.org. Yeah, good morning. God bless you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for attending online or in person. And we are... Uh, zipping through the whole Bible in eight weeks, the Ark of the Bible, we started with creation and talked about the fall. Last week, we discussed the, the patriarchs and got to the book of Genesis. So keep in mind, I had three weeks to get through the book of Genesis. Today, I have 30, 35 minutes to get through uh, six books, uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and Judges. Let's go! <laughs> All right, <clears throat> we're going to just start in the Exodus story with the encounter that Moses has on the mountain uh, when he encounters God. It says, now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock <clears throat> to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. So this would have been after the amazing story of Moses, uh, it was after 400 years of slavery, the people of Israel had been in Egypt, and Moses was born and delivered from being killed through uh, his mother's actions of putting him in the ark in the Nile, and um, of course he grows up <coughs> in the house of Pharaoh, eventually um, flees because he sees the oppression of his own people, uh, the Israelites, by the Egyptians, and it actually caused him to commit murder. He, he, uh, 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 um, an Egyptian guard was beating uh, an Israelite, and Moses uh, intervened and ended up killing the, the, the Egyptian and, and fled into the desert. And so he'd been out there tending sheep, and here he has this encounter. <clears throat> it says in verse 2 that, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush. Moses, Moses. And he said, here am I, or here I am. <laughs> then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. And I know their suffering and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up to the land, uh, to a good land, broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites. It's all the ites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel have come to me, and I have also seen the oppression uh, with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you the Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out to Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the, uh, bring the children of Israel out to Egypt? Who, like, why me? And God said, but but I will be with you, and this will be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, if, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers have sent me, and they ask, what is his name? What shall I say to him? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am have sent uh, me to you. And God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent, to me, uh, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Wow, powerful encounter that Moses had 
in the middle of the desert uh, when he encountered God. A few years ago, I had the privilege of going to Israel, and we went out into the desert area, probably in a, a region that looked similar to where Moses was. And you know, it's a desolate place. And I saw uh, shepherds with their little herds of sheep going through the mountains. And you can just imagine uh, Moses seeing this bush and then uh, approaching it. And it, it picked his curiosity, but then he encountered God in this radical, powerful way. And we see uh, the repeat of this pattern of God choosing a person to lead a people to bring about salvation. And here Moses is chosen as that person to lead uh, God's people out of slavery and to preserve and carry forward that promise of salvation that began way back in the garden when God promised that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head, and that promise was carried forward through Abram and through Isaac and through Jacob. It's each generation uh, continues the lineage, and here we have Moses uh, with a similar uh, command to deliver God's people from bondage. So this is the origin story, the, the beginning, really, of Israel as a nation. So they went when they went to uh, Egypt 400 years earlier, they were just a ragtag gathering of uh, the descendants of uh, Jacob and his 12 sons. And it was a good-sized family, but it wasn't a nation. But over those 400 years, it actually grew to a very, very large number of people. Um, most uh, estimates are in the millions. <clears throat> At least one to two million uh, uh, Israelites were part of the Exodus, depending on which... Uh, uh, commentary you read. <laughs> it was a large number of people. And, and, and the story of the Exodus separates them as a unique nation. And, and in this passage, we read one of the most pivotal, important uh, passages uh, or information in Scripture is where God reveals his name. And in some ways, it's kind of... Um, you know, it's not a clear name. <laughs> What's your name? Well, I am. I mean, I am what I am. You know, this is what you get. <laughs> uh, but it's a powerful name, and it's, it's the, the letters Y-H-W-H. <clears throat> and so if you ever hear us sing the song Yahweh, and you wonder what Yahweh means, uh, that's one way to pronounce it. Um, in the Hebrew language, they didn't use vowels the same as the Greek language. And so uh, we don't know the vowel sounds. <clears throat> uh, they would write it in, in just these four letters. And it wasn't actually until the Babylonian captivity, <clears throat> which we will get through next week, hopefully, <laughs> uh, that um, they stopped pronouncing the Hebrew people uh, uh, in that era thought that God's name was so holy it shouldn't be spoken aloud. Um, and so we lost the uh, pronunciation, the historical pronunciation of the name. <clears throat> and so um, it's often translated uh, Jehovah, and that's filling in uh, the vowel sounds. Uh, but Yahweh is one pronunciation. Jehovah is another pronunciation that translation I am is the most clear. The meaning is I am what I am, or I am, I was, I will be. I like that one because that's what Jesus said, uh, and it's repeated in the New Testament. But the meaning is really uh, the self-existent one. In other words, God is dependent on no one and nothing, and everything else that exists is dependent on him. All right? And keep in mind, it's the name of the Trinity. We serve a triune God, right? So often people think this is the name of the Father, but Yahweh is the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he's a God that we learn, and especially it's revealed most clearly in the New Testament, that exists in three manifestations, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> all right? Um, continuing on, Jesus actually said, and I think this is important, one of the questions that we are applying throughout the whole arc of the Bible is, where is Jesus in this part of the arc? Well, Jesus tells us in the New Testament that no one has, uh, not, uh, no one has ever seen the Father 
Only I who was sent from God have seen him. And so there's no human alive that has seen the Father, according to Jesus. And earlier in the book of John, it says, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God, this is John writing about Jesus, is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. Therefore, every manifestation in the Old Testament of God, whether it be something like this encounter of Moses with the burning bush, or especially when people encounter God in a human form, such as when Abram uh, in the book of Genesis encounters, it says the Lord appeared to him, and then the angel of the Lord spoke, but it says the Lord appeared to him as a man. And those are called theophanies, or appearances of God in physical form. But since Jesus in the New Testament clearly says that's not the Father, and, the, and we understand through Scripture that uh, Jesus comes to manifest the Father, these manifestations are actually the person of Jesus being revealed to us in the Old Testament. Um, and so they're appearances of Jesus. And then again, Jesus is the Word of God, so every word spoken by God Old Testament, New Testament alike, it's Jesus communicating the word and the will of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in word form to communicate God's will to us. And so Jesus is all through. That's why they say Jesus is on every page of the Bible. If you understand these truths, there's not like one God in the Old Testament and Jesus comes in and rescues us from the mean old, uh, old, old grumpy dude on the throne right? No, they are one and they never disagree. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are complete uh, unity and Jesus represents uh, God throughout the whole Old Testament and then is revealed fully. He is manifest. Now, uh, those manifestations in the Old Testament are types, shadows, images, and, uh, you know, miraculous uh, revelations uh, Jesus didn't come in the flesh until he was incarnate in the Virgin Mary. We'll get to that later in the ark. All right, so where's Jesus in this part of the ark uh, of the Bible? Everywhere, right, on every page. And the story of the Exodus is one of the most uh, amazing stories of supernatural deliverance and a type or image of God's plan to rescue the human race as well as individuals. So this is what I mean by this. <clears throat> the whole story of the Exodus from God sending Moses to, and, and the, the process of encountering the worldly powers through the plagues and, and delivering uh, through a miraculous events <clears throat> into a time of testing and trial through the wilderness and finally arriving at the promised land is is it really happened i was talking to someone recently and they were saying well are you saying this is just a metaphor that it didn't really happen no it really happened like i believe this wholeheartedly these are historical truths and there's countless archaeological evidence to to back it up but it happened in order to teach us uh, uh truths that apply to us today and apply to the whole human race and so the story of the Exodus is clearly that. And even the 10 plagues were repeated signs of God's judgment. But listen, they were also signs of God's grace. Every time Pharaoh repented, what did God do? He ended the plague. And he kept giving Pharaoh another chance. And so we see God's confrontation of worldliness and worldly power and judgment, but we also see God's grace and that when he would repent, God would relent and offer grace, but then he would harden his heart and God would have to uh, 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 stand up to him again. And the final plague, the death of the firstborn in and of itself was symbolic that it was the very act, think of this, this was the act that God himself uh, suffered to free humanity from the slavery of the world. All right, so God required Pharaoh, the death of his firstborn son, but that was not something beyond what God was willing to uh, suffer himself. 
and it, and, it, and it prophetically illustrated what God did do. Jesus, we see as the Passover lamb that was slain, the Israelites in Egypt um, uh, had to slay a, a Passover lamb and, and put the blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would pass over their house, but then all the Egyptians would lose their firstborn son. And we see that uh, as symbolic, prophetic of Jesus being the Passover lamb that was slain, um, but also the son that died so that God's people are set free from bondage. And so you can just see, you could spend, my, I could spend the rest of my career unpacking all of the illustrations, the, the prophetic symbols, and the applications, but we're flying at 30,000 feet, and i got to keep going. <laughs> All right, so they, there's the exodus, and, and the Israelites leave Egypt, and uh, God uh, 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 defeats Pharaoh and his armies, and they go through the Red Sea, and it says later in the book in Exodus 19, then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people, this is a uh, uh, now they've arrived at Mount Sinai, and that's the mountain that God appeared uh, to Moses. And so uh, he had delivered them and taken Israelites to Mount Sinai. The Lord again appeared to Moses and said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai. And there's definitely a significance whenever you see uh, numbers uh, like the third day in Old Testament is prophetic of the three days that Jesus was in the grave and Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. And here we see that uh, the people had to prepare because on the third day, God was going to come back and reveal himself to the people. Um, and it says, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. Now, Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. So Moses, uh, we're not sure exactly how long it was before, but he had encountered the burning bush on this mountain. But now the whole mountain was on fire. Right? And its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke. And God answered him by voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. And so <clears throat> this encounter now with the entire nation of Israel camped around this mountain, Moses would go up Sinai. And over the course, uh, we're not sure exactly how long they were at Mount Sinai, but it was probably at least a year uh, Moses actually went up and down and encountered God multiple times, <clears throat> but uh, one of the most uh, significant times um, was when he received the Ten Commandments. He was actually on the mountain without water and without food for 40 days. And so he entered into that supernatural presence of God that sustained him supernaturally. You can't live 40 days without water. You can live 40 days without food, but you can't live more than three days without water. And so we know it was supernatural. And God communicated to him the Ten Commandments and wrote them in stone. And they are the basis not only for the nation of Israel, but for the moral law that has shaped civilization, most of what we call Western civilization, even though this was in, the, in Asia and the Near East, uh, for centuries upon centuries, thousands of years, these Ten Commandments were the, and continue to be, even in our day, uh, even though there's pushback on some of them, there, there's truths that shape society. Um, there's many, many more laws. If you read through uh, Exodus and especially Leviticus, there's many, many requirements, and those are known as ceremonial laws. And all of those have significance. They establish the Jewish culture to differentiate them from the surrounding nations. All right? So it was important that the Jewish people understood that they were to be different than the people in the other nations. And it was important that all the other nations 
could see that this, this nation, this people, they worshiped the God that required uh, behavior that was different than the cultures around them. And so we see a nation or a people group in the midst of cultures that practiced things that violated all of these commandments. Any commandment you see in the Old Testament were common practices of the neighboring nations that God says, they do that, but you must not do that because you need to be different. And it's an important lesson for us because we are called to live in a world that readily accepts behaviors and beliefs that are contrary to God. And God's people from all the way back to this day, to this story, way back in Exodus, were called to live a, to a different rule of life. It's just part of following God. And so being countercultural is what this is all about. And, and all of those ceremonial laws, although they, <clears throat> they were fulfilled upon Jesus' death, so guess what? We can eat bacon. Everybody say, hallelujah. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jesus. All right? And you can eat seafood and all this. There are certain things, but um, <clears throat> uh, uh, there are still principles in all of the laws, uh, even the ones that were fulfilled. And then many of the laws uh, that were moral uh, or, or, or the moral significance of even the symbolic laws are still binding upon Christians, and Jesus actually increases the level of significance, and we'll get to that when we get to the New Testament. All right, so the tabernacle also was communicated to Moses while he was on the mountain, and that was um, a structure that was portable. It was... Um, you know, it was the ultimate in, uh, in, in glamping. <laughs> I don't even know what glamping means. Was it glorious? No, it was, it was gl glamorous camping, right? Well, this was the, this was the bomb, okay? <laughs> it was massive. And it was all uh, really a massive tent made out of animal skins and uh, beautiful and... <clears throat> And it's so full of uh, spiritual truths and symbolism. Get a book and read about it. Uh, it has tons of stuff in it. It was a central focus of the nation of Israel, literally as they wandered through the, uh, uh, the, the wilderness for 40 years. It was always in the center of the camps, and the families would camp uh, uh, to the east, the west, the north, and the south of the central focus of the tabernacle. Uh, and it uh, was later used as the pattern for the temple. And Hebrews in the New Testament tells us a little bit of the, the theology behind it. It says, they in the Old Testament served a system of worship that is a copy or a shadow of the real one in heaven. All right? So all of these things in the Old Testament are, are shadows or copies in the sense of like, the reproductions on a on a natural, uh, worldly scale to teach us lessons about heavenly truths. It says, for when Moses was getting ready to build the tabernacle, God gave him this warning, be sure to make everything according to the pattern I have shown you here on the mountain. So God showed him how, how in a sense, uh, symbolically, prophetically, how heaven is arranged. And uh, again, I would love to go into all of that, but I can't because we have uh, uh, five more books and I'm, I'm already almost the way through this sermon <laughs> time. <laughs> the priesthood also uh, represents a, a repeating pattern where God chooses a person to lead people. And here we have the priests, the descendants of Aaron and the entire family of Levi serving as priests to God's people and the the the. The lineage of Aaron becomes the lineage of the high priest, uh, and the lineage of the Levites are the priests that serve uh, in the tabernacle and become an intermediary between the people of God and God. <clears throat> Jesus becomes a priest, and we learn of this in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews, for your information, was written to 
Hebrews, so that they could understand how that Old Testament system fit in the New Testament theology. And so it really unpacks a lot of this understanding. But Jesus came as a priest, not by meeting the physical requirement of belonging to the tribe of Levi, because he wasn't a Levite, okay? He was actually a descendant of the tribe of Judah. <clears throat> but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed, and the psalmist pointed this out when he prophesied, you are priests priest in the order of Melchizedek. I didn't have the time to talk about Melchizedek, but Abram encountered Melchizedek back in Genesis as a priest of the Most High God. And so we have this mysterious character in the uh, Genesis serving as a priest, and then Jesus comes in the order of Melchizedek, this, this other uh, priesthood that existed before the law, before the Levites. Yes, the old requirement about the priesthood was set aside because it was weak and useless. For Listen, this is the big idea. For the law never made anything perfect, all right? Even from when Moses recorded it and the Israelites are obeying it, <clears throat> it says, now we have confidence in a better hope through which we draw near to God. This new system was established as a so with a solemn promise. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath. But there is an oath regarding Jesus, for God said to him, this is a quote from the Psalms, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow you are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. And so <clears throat> the big idea here, and again, the, as you're reading through the Old Testament and you're reading all these laws, is you must keep in mind that the law never intended to perfect anyone, to make anyone righteous. It always was meant to point toward the fulfillment that would come through the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a big point here. Those in the Old Testament who obeyed the law and offered those sacrifices were doing it in faith, looking forward to the fulfillment that was to come. Remember, it was a, a, a covenant of faith that Abraham believed and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham became right in God's eyes because of faith. Those who followed the Old Covenant uh, operated in faith of what, would, what was to come. We, we now obey the law of Christ in faith, looking back to the finished work of the cross that Jesus accomplished. So in the same way, we are believing in faith of something that was sacrificed, and they were believing in something that would be sacrificed, both of them being Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, <clears throat> kind of a big theological issue there. Think about that for a while. <laughs> All right, Exodus ends, and the cloud uh, covers the, uh, the tabernacle. So they finally build the rest of the Exodus. is all about them actually constructing the ark, and there's some other great stories in there. Not the ark, uh, the tabernacle, as well as the Ark of the Covenant, which is the second uh, or the third ark in the Bible, right? There's Noah's ark the ark that Moses was in, and now the Ark of the Covenant, which is uh, the box uh, that was made out of wood, uh, symbolizing mankind, covered in gold, symbolizing divinity, and so it's a beautiful display of Jesus and the, and the mercy seat on the top of it from which God would speak was in the center of the tabernacle. All of that was finished, and the Lord filled the tabernacle with his glory, the cloud uh, hovered over the tabernacle during the day, and the night of fire glowed inside the cloud. So the whole family of Israel could see it, and this continued throughout all their journey. So they would follow God by following the cloud by day and the fire by night. And the incredible stories of them um, uh, encountering God in many ways. Leviticus <coughs> begins then at the uh, foot of Mount Sinai, and it contains instructions to the Levitical priests and the people of Israel concerning all the different sacrifices. And my word, there are plenty of them. All right. And so by next week, you need to memorize all of them. <clears throat> all right. Also details the worship, uh, the priesthood, ceremonial cleanliness, the, the day of atonement, 
all the feasts and the holy days, the years of jubilee, all of these principles that, that shape the culture as well as the history of, of the nation of Israel, but also all foreshadowed a fulfillment in the New Testament. The central message of Leviticus is that God is holy and requires his people to be so as well. And the book shows that God graciously provides atonement uh, for sin through the sacrificial system, all of that pointing to the fulfillment coming through Jesus. But yeah, God's laws are strict and severe, but there's also grace. One little, little, I just got, there's, most of the laws, they seem like uh, overwhelmingly strict, like an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. And people often quote that as being, boy, that's really harsh. Listen, that was not harsh in their day. That was meant to restrain overreaction, all right? So if somebody pokes out you, your eye, you're not allowed to kill them, their family, and burn down their house, okay? An eye for an eye was actually a, a justice system that was fair and equitable. You can't, uh, you know, if somebody steals a, a, a cow, you know, this is how you repay them. You don't kill them and take everything they own, all right? So it was actually, especially in their day, uh, a way of, 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 of providing justice as well as mercy. All right, and then we have the book of Numbers. The, the Hebrew name for this book, I think, is way better. Numbers refers to the, uh, the, they took a census. I think it was twice in the book of Numbers. They counted all the people. But uh, the real uh, uh, topic of the book of Numbers is them wandering in the wilderness. So that's the Hebrew title, is this in the wilderness. Um, so it, it tells about the journey from Sinai to the promised land. But when they got to the border of the promised land, guess what? They were scared because there were giants in the land, like really big people, and it was fortified. And, and so they didn't have the faith to go in, and <clears throat> um, they ended up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And during those 40 years, uh, your, God is seen as a holy God, that cannot ignore rebellion or unbelief. One time, people were complaining. You know what God does to complainers? He opened up the earth and swallowed, I think it was like 10,000 people. Like he just opened up the earth and they fell in and it, <clears throat> you know? And so don't complain because if you do, you'll be swallowed by the world system, all right? Um, God is shown as the one who faithfully keeps his covenant and, and patiently provides for the needs of his people. Uh, and the numbers ends with a new generation. In other words, all those people that didn't have the faith and the obedience to follow uh, God into uh, God's will into the promised land died in the wilderness, except for Caleb, who was one of the spies. And who else knows the other one? Joshua, because they were ready. They were like, we can do it. God can do it. God's on our side. And so they waited 40 years. Everybody else died. And it was this next generation that had not been slaves uh, so that God could take them into the promised land. And then we have the book of Deuteronomy, <clears throat> also known as the second law. It's actually a retelling of the stories and events, the primary events of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. And so if you read it and go, I think I've read this before, you're right. Okay, and it includes uh, Moses' farewell sermon, it's a rather lengthy sermon, to the people of Israel before uh, he died. And so it's, a, it's actually a really good book to read. It summarizes everything that happens previously. It expands an understanding of the Ten Commandments as well as uh, many of the other laws. And then we have the book of Joshua. <clears throat> After the death of Moses, <clears throat> uh, 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 the Lord, uh, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, and said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these, my people, the Israelites, across Jordan, the Jordan River, into the land I am giving them. <clears throat> I promise you that what I promised Moses, wherever you set your foot, uh, you will, uh, it'll be on land that I give you, I've given you. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you, 
nor abandon you. One of the things I learned when I was in Israel <clears throat> is that the Jordan River connects the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest point on earth. Did you know that? And so the Dead Sea is dead because it's so uh, salty, because it's so low, it, it's able to have a higher concentration of salt, and it had been, it's a very old, so it's, nothing can live in it, salt. But the Jordan River runs along this valley to the Dead Sea, and so the Israelites had to go to the lowest part of the earth in order to come in to the promised land. And literally the promised land, they had to, its, its elevation is thousands of feet higher. And so it's a, it's a symbolic representation of uh, the humility necessary to enter into God's promises. All right, and the name Joshua and Jesus are from the same Hebrew word. Joshua is the Hebrew form of Yeshua, and Jesus would be the English version of the Greek form. And so the, English, uh, the Greek pronunciation is more Jesus, and the Hebrew pronunciation is Joshua. But that then allows us to see that Joshua was an incredible type of Jesus, all right? Moses symbolized the Old Testament law, but he was not able to lead them into the promised land. He himself was not allowed in. Uh, Joshua was, was allowed in, and Joshua uh, prophetically represents Jesus uh, as he leads the people into the promised land. I was thinking about, actually, we were talking about this last night in our community group. Uh, they got a preview because uh, um, I couldn't remember last week's sermon, so we talked mostly about today's sermon. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Joshua, you know, I, I, every character in the Bible, I got to close up here quick, but we, we see negative character traits, but I can't think of anything that Joshua did wrong. And then I realized actually last night, it's because he prophetically illustrated Jesus, the only perfect one. Moses did wrong thing. He committed murder. He got angry. David, oh my goodness. You know, uh, but Joshua, he was faithful his whole life. And he represents Jesus who leads God's people into the promised land. Judges is named after an interesting collection of individuals. Uh, you really should read some great, crazy stories. Um, who led Israel after Joshua's death until the rise of the monarchy under the prophet Samuel, which we'll get into next week. During this time, uh, you would think that being in the promised land, everything would be great. But just being in the right place doesn't mean everything goes right because the people did not follow the Lord. And the, and the defining uh, statement that we learn in the book of Judges is that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And it constantly uh, fell back into societal decay. And we see this pattern of... <clears throat> people uh, abandoning the Lord and the Lord's laws, God punishing them by raising up a foreign power, and then they cry out for deliverance, and then God sends a deliverer. <laughs> Deborah was one, Gideon, Elon, did you know, not the musk guy, uh, <clears throat> Samson, uh, great stories. So what does this mean for us today? Quickly going to give you a little bit of application. Um, you know, God is shown as a deliverer throughout all of these books, and uh, he is still the deliverer. God's nature has not changed. Paul says it this way, Jesus has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So like the Israelites, or like the uh, uh, that were rescued from Egypt, or or, or those who had uh, fallen in sin and rescued by the judges, we need to follow the chosen one of God, Jesus the Messiah, because God wants to deliver us. And then I encourage you to make a list of what God's delivered you from and give thanks. You know, I was delivered from a life of drugs and alcohol and, and confusion and meaninglessness, and God's given me purpose, He's given me family, not only my literal family, but my spiritual family. Um, <clears throat> the Israelites were delivered from slavery, but they held on to idols. 
And so ask yourself, are there things that you're holding on to? Uh, and if so, uh, are you, you need to let go of them, all right? And they can be anything. They can be uh, a food, alcohol, drugs, pornography, uh, this is the, uh, video games. It doesn't matter. The thing doesn't matter. Trucks, you know, some people idolize their car, <laughs> clothes. Uh, themselves, all of those things, anything that replaces your passion and your commitment to God, it becomes an idol. And, and, and these stories teach us we can't hold on to idols. We need to repent and let go of them so that we can experience the deliverance that God has promised. 